friends! Welcome to Eat, Read, Sleep, where we get together to vibe with books. I'm Kalina, and today we'll be going through a book that many of you requested, the national bestseller and one of the more controversial books around, The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Thank you. Hi y'all, I'm Tapas, and make sure you stay tuned for later in the video where we reveal the one law that Robert Greene himself says is the most important law of them all. The lowdown for Mr. Green himself? Um, I can't wait to get to that part, but before we dig in, let's tee this book up real quick. Although a bestseller, The 48 Laws of Power has been called plotting and didactic. It's been questioned for being contradictory and cult-like. It's even been banned in several U.S. prisons. Um, hmm. Did you say prisons? Yeah, crazy, right? This book is revered with the hip-hop community, the Hollywood elite, and prison inmates alike. It's actually the number one requested book from prison. Okay, now I'm interested. So tell me more about this hip-hop impact. Well, 50 Cent loved the book so much that he approached Green and together they collaborated to write a book, The 50th Law, which is another New York Times bestseller. DJ Premier has Law 5 tattooed on him, DJ Calvin Harris has Law 28 tattooed, and you can hear references to 48 Laws in songs from Jay-Z, Kanye West, and Drake. So read 48 Laws if you never read it. Okay, I think it's time to get into the book. Stop it. Stop. Come on. Alright, so if we actually went through all 48 Laws, this episode would be several hours long. So what we're gonna do is simplify it for you. All 48 laws are here for you to see. Yes, it's a lot. And we're gonna group them into four categories for you. Number one, seduce. Two, charm. Three, deceive. And four, subtlety. But before we dig into the laws, it's important to understand the preface of the book so you understand what you're getting yourself into. Okay, so Green points out that we all have an innate desire to have power. Even children fight for a sense of power as soon as they're able to comprehend that they can get something by simply crying. But despite power being something that everyone desires, we live in a world where we have to seem fair and decent, not so power hungry. So it's important to be subtle. Think congenial yet cunning, or democratic yet devious. Yep, Green goes to explain that our modern world is a duplicity to the world of the old aristocratic court, where kings and queens and emperors held power, and those who served them had to play the game of power themselves. Courtiers couldn't fawn too much over their masters because other courtiers would act against them, filled with greed, envy, lust, and hatred. So they went around outwitting and plotting against each other. They subtly stabbed each other in the back, wearing a velvet glove and the sweetest of smiles. Life in court was a never ending game of vigilance and tactical thinking. It was civilized war. Although we don't necessarily have kings and masters in our world today, we are expected to appear civilized, decent, democratic, and fair. But that doesn't mean that those ugly courier emotions don't stir within us. Green challenges us, unless you are a fool, it would serve you well to master the art of indirection. That means learn to seduce, charm, deceive, and subtly outmaneuver others. Bend people to your will without them realizing what you have done. Because if they don't know what you have done, they won't be able to resent or resist you. Okay, this is taking a slightly uncomfortable turn. What if you're just not into those kinds of games? And what if you don't care for power? I mean. It kind of sounds evil and wrong. Hmm, good points. Although, Green argues that no such person exists. Even someone who wants to say they don't want power is playing a game of power. It's actually Law 22, the surrender tactic. A non-player who says they are above the game, who flaunts their moral qualities, those are the types of people who will practice power subconsciously. And you can tell because they greatly resent it when you point out their tactics that they use every day. Remember, power is an innate human desire. Even if it's just a little sense of control in our lives that we need, we still need it. So like it or not, we are all trapped inside this giant scheming court and there is no use trying to opt out of the game. If you fight the game, it will leave you powerless, which goes against your human nature. Therefore, to be powerless is to be miserable. Instead, learn to excel at power. And actually, the better you are at dealing with power, the better friend, lover, spouse, and person you become. Because you learn to make others feel better about themselves. You become the source of pleasure for them. Okay, fair enough. So before we start learning these laws, we need to remember a few things. You guys ready? First off, it's going to take time. 
Much of the game won't come naturally. You'll need a lot of practice. Second, you're going to have to shift your perspective and look at the world a little differently. Remember that intentions don't mean anything, especially when there's no action to back it up. So don't get taken just because you feel bad for someone. And this leads into the third thing, control your emotions. Remember, an emotional response is a mistake that will cost you a lot more than any temporary satisfaction you might gain by expressing your feelings in the moment. Emotions cloud your reasoning. And if you can't see the situation clearly, you can't be prepared and respond with any degree of control. Fourth, develop the ability to study and understand people. And lastly, always be indirect about your route to power. The motto that you should adopt, no days unalert. Don't let anything catch you off guard. That's right. You guys ready to play? Let's play the game of power. All right. So the first grouping of the laws is into the category of seduction. To seduce is to entice or attract someone into a belief or into a course of action that is inadvisable. So these are the laws that fall into the category of seduction. Hmm, that's a lot of seducing. It is. But let's focus on two really big ones from this group. This is especially useful for those of you that work in large organizations. The first important law is the law number five. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. You have to remember that reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone, you can intimidate and you can win. Once it slips, however, you are vulnerable and you will be attacked on all sides. So make your reputation unquestionable. Always be alert to potential attacks and oppose them before they happen to you. Mm. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then you simply stand aside and let the public opinion hang them. Okay, guys, listen carefully. First, you must work on establishing a reputation for one outstanding quality for yourself. It can be generosity, it can be honesty, it can even be cunning. This quality sets you apart and gets other people to talk about you. Then you subtly make your reputation known to as many people as possible. And then you sit back and you watch it spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yep. This alone will exaggerate your strengths without you having to spend any energy at all. And what if someone has a bad reputation? I mean, I don't, but let's just say I do. Easy. You associate yourself with someone that has an image mm -hmm. that counteracts your own. You use their good name to whitewash and elevate yours. Are there any exceptions to this law? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. In all of the 48 laws, yes, there are exceptions or reversals as Green calls them. But when we're talking about reputation, there is no possible reversal. Reputation is critical. By not caring how you're perceived, you let others decide this for you. So be the master of your fate and be the master of your reputation. Mm, like the saying goes, your reputation precedes you. Exactly. Mm. Okay, so what's the next important law in seduction? Oh, this isn't just the next important law. This is the most important law. Mm. According to Green, law number 11, learn to keep people dependent on you mm. is the most critical law of all. To maintain your independence, you must always be needed. You must always be wanted. The more you're relied on, the more freedom you have. So make people depend on you for their happiness and prosperity, and you will have nothing to fear. Remember, never teach them enough so that they can do the job without you. You want to think of it this way. If others aren't dependent on you, sooner or later, someone else will come along and do your job just as well. Someone that might be younger, fresher, less expensive, and maybe even less threatening. So. Be the only one who can do what you do and make people so dependent on you that they can't possibly get rid of you. Precisely. You have to possess a talent or create a skill that simply cannot be replaced. And let's say if you don't have a skill that makes you indispensable, well, 
just make it look like you are. Yeah, and you don't have to be just intertwined with one person. You have to spread your skill set in different groups mm -hmm. so extensively that if you are cut off, the other parts of the chain would unravel. This is called the chain of dependence. So in other words, you take the secret intelligence tactic. Find out other people's secrets and seal your fate with theirs. This will make you untouchable. Now let's look at the next bucket of loss, charm. Charm is a power or quality of giving delight or arousing admiration. So check out these laws under charm below. And out of these, we are gonna dig into laws one and 13. Ooh, good ones. Let's hear it, law one. How shall we never outshine the master? So the main thing of law number one is always make those above you feel superior. In your desire to please them or impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite goal. You might start to inspire fear and some kind of insecurity in them. So make your masters appear more brilliant than they really are and you will attain the heights of power. Yikes. So Okay, I'm thinking of all the people at work mm -hmm. who are kind of like know-it-alls and they try to one-up everyone. You, you know the people, right? The boss tolerates it. You can tell he doesn't love being talked over or made to look like he doesn't know everything. Yes, and many people do this. And it's a problem because every single person has some kind of insecurity. Mm -hmm. When you show yourself to the world and display your natural talent, you start to show some kind of resentment and envy. And keep in mind, this should be expected, but you cannot spend your life worrying about the petty feelings of others. When it comes to those above you, when it comes to power, outshining the master is the worst mistake of all. Now, there are two rules that you have to realize when it comes to this law. First, you can inadvertently outshine the master simply by being yourself. So if you're naturally charming and you can't help being superior, you must learn to avoid people in power who are vain and insecure. Either that or find ways to downplay your good qualities while you're in their company. Secondly, just because a master loves you, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Favorites fall out of favor just as quickly as anyone else, maybe even faster especially when they take their status for granted. So don't let any of the favors get to your head. Got it. So what's the best way to not outshine your master? What can we do? Hmm. First, you want to flatter and puff up the master. Over flattery can work, but it has limits. Best to be discreet. It's much more powerful. Yes, and do this by seeming less intelligent. That's kind of weird, right? You want to act naive, make it seem like you need their expertise at all times. You want to commit harmless mistakes that will not hurt you in the long run, but will give you a chance to ask for his or her help. And when it comes to ideas, you want to make it clear that your ideas came clearly from your master. Make it known to the public that your master is a creative one. By letting others outshine you, you actually remain in control instead of being a victim of their insecurity. You got it. And the next law in the charm category that we're gonna explore is law number 13. When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude. If you need to turn to someone for help, don't even bother reminding them of your past assistance, what you've done, any good deeds. They'll find a way to ignore you. Mm -hmm. So instead, uncover something in request or in your alliance with them that will benefit them and emphasize it out of proportion. They will respond enthusiastically when they see something that can be gained for themselves. From the German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, most men are so thoroughly subjective that nothing really interests them but themselves. They always think of their own case as soon as ever any remark is made. And that's the innate behavior that we just can't gloss over. Also consider this, when you bring up the past, something that you've done, not only does it make the person feel obligated to be grateful, it's a subtle way of making them feel guilty. It makes a person wonder how to discard this burden of obligation. And their first thought will be just by reading of themselves of you altogether. 
So do not confuse your needs with theirs. Mm -hmm. The biggest mistake that people do is talk as if their own needs matter to other people. Guys, let's be real. People could care less about you or your needs, especially in the workplace. So you'll need to understand the other person's psychology. You need to train yourself to think your way inside the other person's mind, to see their needs, to see their interests, and then embed what it is that you need into your request for them. Mm. Now the next bucket takes quite a turn. Now we take a look at deceit. To deceive is to cause someone to believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. And these are the laws that fall in this bucket. So when we look at deceiving, no better law to turn to than law number two. Never put too much trust in friends. Mm. Learn to use your enemies. You know the saying, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer? Exactly. But be wary of your friends. They will betray you more quickly. Friends are easily envious and they will become spoiled and controlling. But if you hire a former enemy, they will be more loyal than a friend mm -hmm. because they have more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from your friends than from your enemy. And if you don't have any enemies, find a way to make them. So you might ask yourself, isn't it natural to want to turn to your friends in times of need? I mean, you know them, they know you. So why would you hire a stranger or an enemy when you can just bring on a friend? Well, the problem is you don't often know who your friends are. You don't know them as well as you might imagine you do. Friends tend to agree on things in order to avoid argument. They cover up unpleasant qualities so that they don't offend each other. Here's a tricky part. So when you hire a friend, you gradually discover qualities that they have kept hidden from you. And keep that in mind, people naturally want to feel good about the fortune that they get. So over time, the favor you did of bringing them on will become oppressive. There's almost a touch of condescension in the act of hiring friends that secretly afflicts them. Another problem with using or hiring friends is that they will inevitably limit your power because friends are rarely the one who can help you the most. In the end, skill and competence are far more important than friendly feelings. So guys, the key to power then is the ability to judge who is best able to further your interest in all situations. You want to keep friends for friendship, but work with the skilled and competent. That's right. So the next law under deceit is law number three, conceal your intentions. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. And if they have no clue what you're up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke. And by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. So there's two ways to do this. First, use decoy, false sincerity, and send ambiguous signals. If people can't distinguish what's real or fake, they can't pick out your real goals. What we see is that people tend to be open books. They say things that they feel, they blur out opinions at every opportunity. Yeah, what people don't realize is that honesty is likely to offend people. Mm -hmm. It's better to tailor your words, telling people what they want to hear. For instance, support an idea or a cause that actually is contrary to your own sentiments. Yeah. And the second way to conceal your intentions is to use smoke screens to disguise your actions. You can easily distract people's attention from the real purpose by leading them down a familiar path, something that they're comfortable with. Check it out. You want to be bland. You want to be inconspicuous. And don't draw attention to yourself. The best type of smoke screens are your facial expressions, noble gestures, and behaviors of repeat pattern that people rely on. The simple truth is this. People can only focus on one thing at a time. So it would be too difficult for them to imagine that a bland and harmless person they're dealing with is simultaneously setting something else up. So with these steps, what you've done is first, you use a decoy to actively create a distraction. Then in your smoke screen, you lull your victims, drawing them into a web. Okay, I think that's enough to see for one day. Let's move on to something a little easier to swallow, the art of subtlety. So here are the laws that fall under subtlety. Now, to be subtle is to be so delicate or so precise as to be difficult to analyze or describe, making use of clever and indirect methods to achieve something. 
So let's turn to a law that's popular amongst the Stoics. Law number four, always say less than necessary. What you're really good at. Mm, thank you. When you're trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear and the less in control. Even if you are saying something that's very obvious, it will seem original if you make it vague, you make it open-ended, and you make it sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. And so the more you say, the more likely you are to sound foolish. In many ways, power is a game of appearance. So when you say less than necessary, you appear greater and more powerful than you are. In fact, humans are wired for interpretation and explanation. Silence makes them uncomfortable. Yeah, so the short answers and silences will put people up on defense and they will jump in, nervously filling in the silence with all kinds of comments that will reveal valuable information about them and their weaknesses. So learn this lesson, guys. Once you, the words are coming out of your mouth, you cannot take them back. So keep your words under control and particularly careful with sarcasm. What do you think, Cal? Ah, uh, I think you're catching on. Now, let's dig into the one last law of subtlety. Pose as a friend, work as a spy. Knowing your rival is critical. Use spies to gather valuable information that will keep you a step ahead. Better yet, play the spy yourself. Mm -hmm. In polite social encounters, learn to probe. Ask indirect questions to get people to reveal their weaknesses and their intentions. There is no occasion that is not an opportunity for artful spying. And remember that you control your fate. Leave nothing you do to chance and do not wing anything. So during social gatherings and casual encounters, pay attention because this is when people's guards are down. Emphasize friendly chatter, give false confessions. They'll give you a real one. Purposely contradict people who are in conversation with you as a way to irritate them. Stir them up so that they lose some control over their words. Their emotional reaction will reveal all kinds of truths about themselves. Truths that you can later use against them. The power of artful spying is this. It reveals a person's character. It makes you seem all powerful. And when you do it subtly, no one will see the source of your power. What they cannot see, they cannot fight. Guys, it's too late to warn you now. Power is endlessly seductive and deceptive. You've made it this far, and you've had a taste of what you can employ in your own life. With this information, you can have satisfaction by studying and reflecting. And make sure you purchase a book via the links in the below. Yes. Or heed the punishment of just skimming the surfaces of power and looking for a good time. The gods of power frown upon the frivolous. And if you manage to seduce, charm, deceive your opponents, you will attain the ultimate power, your move.